Oh, and that is the race to become the next Speaker of the House of Representatives. Two Republicans announced officially now they are running to replace Kevin McCarthy. They are Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Jim Jordan, and Majority Leader Steve Scalise. Scalise has been the number two Republican leader under McCarthy since 2019, and Jordan, the founding chair of the House Freedom Caucus, now serving as one of the party's leaders in the impeachment inquiry into President Biden. In their letters, to their colleagues pitching their candidacies, both Jordan and Scalise pledged to unite the Republican conference. Meanwhile, for the latest episode of The Circus, Jen Palmieri, our good buddy, and Heilman's colleague sat down with Republican Congressman Tim Burchett of Tennessee after he cast a vote to remove Kevin McCarthy as speaker. Here's what he said. The leadership right. is probably not thinking that you're going to be a problem. They're probably thinking you're going to well, vote to... Well, my thought was, you know, do I trust my conscience? You know, and, and I prayed about it. And honestly, I slept like a baby last night. I slept like a baby last night. And Kevin McCarthy called me this morning. And the first thing he said was something I thought was very condescending. What about, did he say? Just about, you know, well, were your prayers answered? Something, I don't know. To me, it just, it just said right there. I said, I said, well, you've, you've answered. You've answered it right there. And I said, remember after I hung up with him, after it was kind of heated towards the end, I, I said, thank you, Lord. You gave me my answer. It maybe wasn't the one I wanted, but it was the right answer. I want a leader, ma'am, that does not only, I don't want to do exactly what I say, even though it'd be a lot easier for me, <laughs> but I, I want one that, that, that takes these issues on head on. I don't need a best friend in the speaker's office. I need somebody that's going to, that values our oath and what we promise we say we're going to do as much as I do. So, Joe, you listen to the, the justification for these right. votes from this group of eight, and you do hear as, uh, in that interview with Jen and others how personal it was in many ways for them that they didn't like Kevin McCarthy or their feelings right. were hurt in some way by Kevin McCarthy, and so they voted to turn the whole thing upside down. Yeah, and again, politics is a personal thing. You either have the touch or you don't have the touch, and it doesn't sound like Kevin McCarthy had the touch. Um, whatever he did to this guy that offended him. I mean, Joe, if you came into me and said, if I was Kevin McCarthy and, and you were uh, you were a congressman and you said, uh, had, had said that you were going to prey on your decision, I walked in to see how it was going to, to lobby you to be right. with me. The thing I wouldn't say is, so did you talk to your God last night? Yeah, exactly. What'd you, what'd you, what'd you, did you finally do that prayer thing? Yeah. Did you get down on your knees? You know, I mean, no, no, that's, that's like what, the right that's approach. That's this guy's like, oh, yeah, it actually did. And thank you very much. I, you know, but it, it makes them all sound kind of puerile, right? I mean, he was called me up and he was condescending. And I, it's just, it's nothing there about the say, need to keep the government going or say, the issues or the spending. The it's all about the like, personal relationships. It's politics, right? I keep saying you've got to be good with personal relationships. But man, it, politics is a tough game. You got to put up with a lot of stuff, and you keep your head down. I mean, and if I, 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 I say it all the time call, when people go, "Oh, he said yeah. that my bill Ooh. wasn't drafted well." <laughs> I'll go, "Dude, I go to lunch with people who call me a murderer. Like it's a rough game." That's very condescending. <laughs> that is, <laughs> very patronizing. I mean, very patronizing. I mean patronizing. <laughs> but the point is. Yeah, it's a tough game. You're in the public spotlight. I just, again, if I, it seems to me, the burden, the burden was was it was shifted the wrong way. The burden was on Kevin McCarthy for them to not explain why they were going to blow up the house, and and remove the speaker for the first time in American history. Instead of having the burden being on themselves and their own thought process saying, is this so bad mm -hmm. that I can't get by another week? So now we're hearing from this congressman and we're hearing from other members of Congress. So I'm sure, you know, they they have a vote. They have the, they're empowered by their their 600,000 people to do what they want to do. So that's his choice. But it seems to me the burden here should have been. I'm going to do something that's never been done in the history of United States government, and it is going to send shockwaves across the globe about how dysfunctional American democracy is, and this will be loved by Vladimir Putin and Xi and the mullahs in Iran and by Erdogan and by everybody who considered us, considers us their enemies. Do I have to take this vote and vacate the chair? Instead of, 
I didn't like what he said about my prayer. But that's a different Congress and a different, you know, Republican Party and different conservatives well, it, in the Republican Party. It's responsibility. Party that. It's like, like you put, put, it, it's actually putting your country over your petty feelings and feelings and i think you know now the Repu a lot of what the republican party has become after donald trump we talk about this all the time is be tough and be tougher than the other guy and personal animus like i'm not going to let you take over me i'm not going to be i'm not going to sit behind closed doors and let you say whatever you want to me i'm going to come out front and, and, and knife you in, in the front and also not thinking about the implications talking about that history right like do is this is this man so bad is kevin mccarthy so bad that i'm willing to be, make him the first speaker in history who loses his seat, right. people weren't thinking about that. Right. They were thinking about the personal. You know, Matt Gates was not thinking about that. He wasn't yeah. thinking about how the impact, how this is going to look to folks. And that is a completely different Republican Party than we've seen in a long well, time. Well, Jonathan O'Meara, there's a Washington Post piece this morning that talks about how bad this is for American democracy, how dysfunctional it makes American democracy look. <laughs> and basically, they don't, they don't bring up Seinfeld, which is supposed to be a TV show about nothing. But this is a shutdown about nothing. Mm. I mean, and, and that was so illustrated when Kevin McCarthy was in his 14th or 15th vote and somebody asked one of the ringleaders of this group back then, what, 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 what other demands do you have? Well, we don't really have any. I can't think of any other. He's given us everything we want. And yet they continued. It was about nothing. It was about gestures. It was about fundraising. It was about blowing up the United States government and sending a fundraising letter out while you were doing it. Yeah, that's precisely right. That these are people involved here aren't interested in governing. They're, they're interested in grabbing a headline, making some money, pitching their next podcast, trying to figure out a, co a, a cable contributor deal after they leave office. Whatever it might be, they're looking to enhance their own brand or stardom and doing very little in terms of advancing an agenda. Frankly, some people believe that they'd rather be in the minority because you can just bomb throw and you well, don't sure. actually have to lead. Uh, so I think that is where we are now. And that is what we're going to see for the next couple of weeks as this speakership fight is going to be protracted and ugly, most believe. It comes against the backdrop of a possible government shutdown. We're only about 40 odd days or so until that happens. President Biden has had this question put to him repeatedly. Foreign allies, to your point, Joe, ask him, like, okay, America is back in the post-Trump era, but for how long? And Biden tells that story about being at his first G7 summit after taking office and being greeted with real anxiety from the leaders of some of our longest and staunchest allies. And this right here, this uncertainty, and that includes, Willie, the uncertainty about whether there'll be Ukraine funding mm -hmm. coming forward here. And I know President Zelensky asked this morning, says he believes the U.S. will stand with, uh, with Kyiv in the months ahead. There's real worry that it's going to be at a much smaller portion than it was before. And this alliance, which is starting to show its first signs of fraying, could take a real hit if the Republicans get their way. And we're seeing some resistance to that funding, not just from that radical group of Republicans, but it seems to be spreading just a bit. Mark, you've got a new piece in The Atlantic titled The Souvenir Speakership. Mark writes in part, quote, Washington loves a death watch, which is what McCarthy's speakership provided from its first wee hours. He always had a strong short timer aura about him. The gavel looked like a toy hammer in McCarthy's hands, the way he held it up <laughs> so to awful. show all of his friends Come once on. he was elected. He essentially gave his tormentors the weapon of his own demise, the ability of a single member of his conference to execute a motion to vacate at any time. Tuesday, as it turned out, is when the hammer fell. Day 269 of Kevin held hostage, writes Mark Leibovich. So, mm -hmm. uh, Mark, we were saying that in real time. You get the job, but at what price? He wanted to call himself the Speaker of the House. He was able to do that for about nine months. But on that 15th vote, he agreed to a rule that cost him the job. Yeah, and, and again, this was all pretty inevitable. I mean, people were saying, I mean, almost from, from the word go, that, uh, okay, this is going to get Congressperson <laughs> X to to you know, call the motion to vacate. Um, so, you know, in some ways, McCarthy's whole strategy was just getting through day to day, promise this, renege on that, you know, dance a little here, dance a little that. I mean, his, his, basically his mantra during his brief speakership was keep dancing. And, and obviously there are limits to, uh, to the politics of dancing. Yeah, that just came to me. Do a little dance. No, no. make a little it's Casey in the sunshine. Get man. down tonight. Is, is that what you're saying? Are you saying that he's Casey in the sunshine? No, band? I'm is he Harry Casey? The '80s <laughs> pop band. Anyway, um, aging myself. No, but so uh, as we learned from not far enough, they're in the '70s pop band. Go ahead. <laughs> no, the politics of dancing was in the '80s.
Okay. Right. Anyway, I, I think <laughs> what we learned here is, which is something we've learned before, which is that these are some of the neediest people in America mm -hmm. coming to the one of the most neediest. Is Kevin particularly here. needy? Kevin McCarthy? Yeah. Not necessarily. He's on the other side of the neediness. He basically spends his whole day catering to the needinesses of the Tim Burchetts of the world. Except and that he doesn't really cater to it because then he doesn't give them what they, he said well, he was going to give them. I mean, that's where I almost feel sorry for him in that, you know, how do you keep all of these people who are trying to get on TV and trying to be the dissenter and trying to, to be the kind of the person who is seen as the agitator, how do you keep everyone happy? How Though do you they keep never happy, right? That's well, the most of them were, to be honest. I mean, to be fair, I mean, you know, he got the, the vast majority of his caucus. Um, he kept it together longer than I certainly thought. And, and again, I don't think he did it in an enviable way. I don't think he did it in a principled way. That's not Kevin McCarthy. But, 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 but let's say the obvious. If he had a 30-vote majority like everybody yes. thought he was going to have a 30-vote majority, no we problem. would have never talked about any of this. Correct. You have 5, 10, 15 people raising hell. They're pushed off to the side. You yep. take them off the committees because you have enough people to take them off the committee. You punish them. The second the Democrats overperformed as much as they did, this was going to be a, a hellacious job for anybody but Nancy Pelosi. Correct. Yeah, yeah no, knows how to I, I agree. I, I think that, you know, yes, his fate was sealed when he agreed to the motion to vacate uh, rule, but I also think it was sealed when we had such a slim margin yeah. in the House uh, back in November. And it's important to remember he was thinking a year before the election, he was going to win by 50. Mm -hmm. That's what they kept telling I mean, I, I, here's, a, here's a prime example of, of, of the unintended consequences of conservatives getting their dream, which is the banning or the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And it's just one more example of, of, of Roe v. Wade having an impact on American politics because there's no doubt abortion played a huge role in stunting that red wave. Yeah.